Well, before we jump into Romans chapter 6, I need to talk to you about the super exciting subject of neuroplasticity. And you know that you were excited to come today and hear about neuroplasticity. How many of you have heard that term? Okay, a good number. And it's a growing, growing number of people that are hearing and learning about neuroplasticity. It is um, probably the most important discovery in the neurosciences. And so here's a somewhat dry uh, definition of what neuroplasticity means. Neuroplasticity can be defined as our brain's ability to change, remodel, and reorganize for the purpose of improving our ability to adapt to new situations. Despite the fact that the concept of neuroplasticity is quite new, it is one of the most important discoveries in neuroscience. The fact is that neural networks are not fixed, but appearing and disappearing dynamically throughout our whole life, depending on our experiences. While we repeatedly practice one activity, such as a sequence of movements or a mathematical problem, neuronal circuits are being formed, leading to better ability to perform the practiced task with less waste of energy. Once we stop practicing a certain activity, the brain will redirect these neuronal circuits by a use it or lose it principle. In other words, contrary to what was believed until just fairly recently, it was believed that following childhood, your brain network and the neurons were set and didn't change. But now what has been discovered is that our neural networks are being rewired all the time. And that they're being rewired based on what we think about repeatedly and what we do repeatedly. It's why like a virtuoso, uh, a guitar virtuoso for instance, can do these incredible things on the guitar with hardly even thinking about it. Because they've done that over and over and over again so that the neural pathways involved in firing the muscles and in their arms and fingers and so on and so forth, those pathways are so interconnected and so developed that the person can literally almost do it without thinking. That's called neuroplasticity. It's the same way for really anything that you give your mind and you give your body to in a repeated manner you are strengthening the neural pathways. Now, that can be for good or that can be for ill. That can be for good or that can be for ill. Now, as we come to Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 23, we understand that the Apostle Paul didn't know about neuroplasticity. But what he did understand is its practical outworkings. And Paul understood that whatever we give our minds to eventually controls us. Whatever we give our bodies to eventually controls us. And now we understand the mechanism. But the truth remains that whatever we think about and whatever we do repeatedly comes to control our lives. Now, what we will discover in Romans 6, 15 through 23, is that neuroplasticity, or rather its practical outworking, is one of the reasons why Christians should not continue in sin. It's one of the reasons why we as Christians should pursue sanctification. It's why we should put energy into the spiritual transformation God wants to bring about in our lives, having justified us he is working to change our character from the inside out to be characterized by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. God has a goal for your life to become more and more like Jesus Christ and to have an impact in your life on those around you. And Paul is going to argue, based on neuroplasticity or its practical outworking, that this is one of the reasons why we should no longer continue in a self-centered life, but we should pursue and put our energy into the process of sanctification. Now, as we come to Romans 6, 
Beginning with verse 15, you'll notice that Paul starts this new section of chapter 6 the very same way he started the chapter, and that is with a question. And the question is, why not continue in sin since we're under grace? Look with me at Romans 6, 15. Paul says, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Now, as a Bible student, you should immediately ask, why did Paul ask that question? Why did Paul ask that question? And what we'll discover is, it's because of what he said in verse 14, and he's anticipating that Christians, Christians will twist what he says in verse 14. Look with me at verse 14. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. Now remember, Paul is writing to believers in Rome. They have been justified by faith in Christ. And now Paul is teaching them about sanctification, about this process of spiritual transformation, the change of their character into the very likeness of Christ. We understand that justification delivers us from the penalty of sin, Sanctification delivers us from the power of sin. And this is Paul's concentration in these chapters, is on sanctification and how we're saved, delivered from the power of sin over our lives. Now, as we've discovered and we've talked about, sanctification proceeds primarily with the renewing of our minds. Becoming like Christ, spiritual transformation takes place primarily through the renewing of our minds by the truth of God's Word. Now, we've already seen examples of that in chapters 5 and 6. In chapter 5, we were confronted with the truth that we are no longer in Adam. We are not in Adam. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ, you are not in Adam. You are not a sinner under the reign of death. But you are in Christ And you are alive to God, and you stand in grace to receive from God His unmerited favor and resources in this process of change. That is something we are to believe. That is something by which our minds are to be renewed. We are to put off this thinking that we are still sinners. We are not sinners. You are justified. You are reconciled. You are redeemed. You stand alive to God under His grace. That is who you are in Christ, and that is what you need to be thinking about and seeing yourself as in Christ and not in Adam. That's the renewing of your mind. Now, that's not make-believe. That's a truth declared in God's Word. We've studied it, have we not? Now, last week, we studied the fact that we are united with Christ in His death to sin and in His resurrection to new life. That is something that needs to renew our thinking about ourselves. Sin is no longer our master. We were united with Christ in his death to sin. We have been separated from sin's power. It is no longer our master. We were united with Christ in his resurrection to new life. We are now alive to God to live a new quality of life. These are things that Paul tells us in verse 11 of chapter 6 to continue to count these things as being true of ourselves. Do you remember that where he says, consider these things? That's a continual, that the verb is in the present tense. We are to continue to count these things as true to ourselves. I am no longer in Adam, I am in Christ. I was united with Christ in his death to sin and his resurrection to new life. That's who I am in Christ. Now Paul made application that this is why it is inappropriate for a Christian to continue in sin. For a Christian to say, well, it's all good, I'm under God's grace, it's all covered, all my sins are forgiven, it doesn't really matter how I live my life now, because I'm going to go to heaven when I die. And Paul says, what? And that's exactly how he says it. (laughs) Paul says, what are you talking about? You're in Christ, you're not in Adam anymore. In Christ is the self-centered life, or I mean, in Adam is the self-centered life, that's our core problem. We want to be the gods of our own world rather than worshiping and submitting to the true God of all the universe. Why would you continue to live in a manner from which you were delivered 
by Christ. To continue to live in sin and to pursue a self-centered lifestyle is to be living completely contrary to who we are in Christ, who we have been liberated to be in Christ. And now today, Paul is going to teach a second reason why believers should not just continue in sin, but should pursue sanctification with all the energy that we have. And it's because of this reality of neuroplasticity. It's because of the reality that whatever you give your mind to and whatever you give your body to comes to control you. Comes to control you. And so a Christian can relinquish that mastery to sin once again. Can come under sin's control. And why would we do that? Why would we go back to the pigsty? But because of neuroplasticity and the reality of neuroplasticity, what we give our minds to and what we give our bodies to controls us. Look with me here at at verse uh, 15 through 23. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? Now, Paul, in order to teach this principle, has adopted the imagery of slavery. Would you agree? Talks about being slaves. Well, the issue is control. This is what he's talking about. Whatever we give ourselves, to whatever we give ourselves, that thing will control us. It will come to control us. Again, as we've seen neuroplasticity, whatever we think over and over again, what does it do to the neural pathways? It strengthens those neural pathways and the connections to other pathways that are involved in that thought. If we continuously do something What does that do to the neural pathway involved in that activity? It strengthens it. Now again, can you see how this can be for good or how it can be for evil? Okay, neuroplasticity is is morally neutral. It's simply the mechanism. It's the reality of the way God has made our brains to function. And so Paul can say here, whatever you give yourself to, Believers, Christians, whatever you give yourself to is going to control you. If you give yourself to sin and to self-centeredness and things related to that, that's going to come to control your life. If you give yourselves to obedience to God, obedience to Jesus Christ, that will come to control your life. Notice what he says in verse 17, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Now, wouldn't you want to be known as a slave of righteousness? Now, if some of you don't, you kind of have this uh, dry as crackers view of Christianity, you, you're not understanding A slave to righteousness is not this person who dresses in black and never smiles and never has any fun or anything like that, like Dawn. (laughs) But a person of righteousness is one who walks in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ and does what is right in the sight of God and man and reaps the wonderful, life-giving blessings of that kind of a lifestyle. Freedom, peace, joy, purpose, love, warmth, humor. My goodness, people who walk in righteousness are some of the people who laugh the easiest and the most ready because their hearts are free. It's the best way to live. And I'm really talking to young people because in just a moment, as we come to the latter part of this passage, I want to address this. But those who have lived a long life know that the way of righteousness is the sweetest way of life. To do what is right in the sight of God and of man leads to such freedom and such joy and such purpose. 
Paul is rejoicing that the Roman believers are those who have responded rightly to the godly teaching they've received. And they've come under its control. Paul goes on to say in verse 19, I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Again, what is Paul saying here? Paul is teaching us the principle that whatever, wherever you place your mind, whatever you bring before your mind on a regular, repeated basis will come to control you because you are strengthening the, the neural pathways of that thought process. Whatever you give your body to and you do repeatedly, that thing will come to or those things will come to control your life because of the reality of neuroplasticity. And Paul is warning us as Christians then, we need to be very thoughtful what we bring before our minds. Would you agree that that would be a, a, a reasonable application of what he's teaching us? If what we think can change the neural pathways and control our lives, then is it not an important discipline for each of us to develop and that is to examine to evaluate what are we bringing before our minds now we have the biggies like pornography right you don't want to do that because it's clear the science is is showing us that neuroplasticity as one encounters as one is involved with pornography those neural pathways those new neural pathways are cut and that's why it becomes very difficult over time to break free from pornography. We understand this about alcoholism. Okay? We understand this about drug addiction. But folks, I think when we get away from those biggies, I tend to think we don't take seriously that the same thing is true about social media. If you're continually going to social media and spending a huge amount of time in social media, what is that doing to your brain? Those neural pathways are being strengthened. Well, how about video games? Why is there a rampant addiction to video games? Because what's happening? Every time you sit down and you play the game, what's happening to your brain? Those neural pathways are being strengthened to where that becomes the controlling issue in your life. What about bitterness? You see, the characteristic of bitterness is that it plays over and over again the offense. What is that doing to the neural pathways associated to that thought? It's strengthening them. So what happens then over time? That's where your thoughts go. Because you've cut such a huge pathway because of bitterness. How about materialism? Okay, we think about wanting, wanting, wanting. I would be so much happier if I had this, this, this. That's a thought pattern. What happens if we keep thinking that thought pattern? We strengthen the neural pathways associated with that thought pattern and it comes to control our lives. But on the positive side, as we spend time in God's word, bless is the man, bless is the woman who meditates on the word of God day and night. Why? What is happening in our brains when we meditate on God's word and we're taking in God's word on a regular basis and we're thinking his thoughts? What's happening to our brains? It strengthens those neural pathways. What will happen over time if you obey Romans 11, Romans 6, 11, and continue to count it as true that you are in Christ, that you've been united with Christ, and you are now liberated from sin, and you're liberated from death, and you are alive to God? What will happen if you continually think those thoughts? 
You see, folks, this is a call for us. This is a call for us. This is where we need to put our energies. Now, some of us have not thought about that. We just think we just present ourselves to God and zap. He makes us like Christ. Well, that's not true. That's not the way God has chosen to work. It doesn't happen as a zap. It is a process in which we are really in. Grace is not opposed to our energy, putting energy into the process of sanctification. Grace is opposed to the idea that we do anything to merit from God his favor. But if we're going to grow in sanctification, if we're going to become like Christ, we must put our energies into these things that he's revealing to us. We must count. We must continually count it to be true about ourselves, these truths of who we are in Christ. We need to take seriously that whatever we put before our minds and whatever we do continually will come to control us. And the good news is that righteousness, the Spirit of God, the Word of God, as we put our minds and we act on God's Word, more and more can come to control us, and we can become slaves of righteousness. We can become servants of Jesus Christ. Neuroplasticity works in our favor, doesn't it? In a powerful, powerful way life-changing way but you and I have to take into consideration what am I bringing before my mind what am I doing with my body because however you answer that will determine what controls you and now as Paul in 20 through 23 I think he gives a third reason and that is you know if you're a Christian and you continue in sin is it worth what you forfeit? Because look what it says, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. You didn't care about what was right or wrong. Because you were living your own self-centered life. I was living my own self-centered life. I wanted to be the God of my own kingdom. I didn't care about right or wrong. Did whatever suited me. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that interesting that that's in the context of not justification, it's in the context of what? Sanctification. And so basically, Paul is saying, well, those Christians, those of you that want to go and live a, a, a life of sin, stop and think about what you're giving up. And are you really going to tell me that what the fruit that you get in living a, sin, a self-centered, a sin-controlled life is better than what you have in the Spirit? The life-giving, joyful fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, you're telling me the things in the world, pursuing your own desires, the fruit you get from that is better than the fruit of the Spirit that you get in sanctification? And this is where we as young people, particularly as Christians, particularly if we think the Christian life is just this bunch of rules that we have to think. There was a time probably in all of our lives when we thought like being a Christian was a negative because it keeps us from doing all the fun things in, that, that you can do in the world, like fornicate. Just go out and, you know, just lay with anybody that you can get a hold of, right? Or that we can go out and just party, just party out of our minds, just get smashed, just get so high, we can fly, flying higher than a kite. Man, that is so fun. That is just such an awesome way to live. Or we were free to gossip. Or we were free to covet you know and be discontent with what we have and craving everything everybody else have man that's just an awesome way to live isn't it that's so much better than having peace isn't it that's so much better than having a faithful spouse 
that you share warmth and intimacy with and oneness with? Isn't it so much better to live in the world, to live in sin? Isn't that, isn't the fruit of sin so much better than the fruit of the Spirit? Amen? Can I get an amen? Amen. But you know what? That is the way we tend to think in our immaturity. And particularly when we're young people and we're students in high school and college. It's just like, oh man, Christianity is like killing all my fun. My goodness. Folks, when you walk in the Spirit and when you do what Paul is describing here and your life more and more becomes characterized by love and joy and peace and patience, and goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control, and you live with a wife who epitomizes that. You know, I love going home at the end of the day. I love waking up in the morning with the same woman I've woken up to for 34 years. Sometimes we're sleepier than others, depending on who snored more, but, you know, I still... (laughs) I love going home. My house is a place of peace. My house is a place of warm love. The greatest thing in my life is to sit at table with my three children and my wife, my sister, Eileen, anyone else that we brought around the table and just to enjoy a deep love. There's no strife, there's no drama, there's no hatred, there's no backbiting, there's no gossip, there's no coveting. There's just the deep love of Christ And you know where I speak. Can anybody give an amen to that? I know you can. And particularly young people who are new in your walk with God. That is the life of sanctification. It's not this boring straitjacket of do's and don'ts. But it's life. It's joyful. It's wonderful. We laugh around our table all the time. We have great joy and great fun without all the drama that sin brings because of the freedom that is ours in Christ Jesus and that is in the Spirit. We don't agree on everything, but even there, Christ has shown us how to love each other and agree to disagree. Do you really want to go back into sin and forfeit the fruit of the Spirit? Does it make sense as a Christian to forfeit all of these life-giving, wonderful blessings we receive when we trust in Christ and then we pursue the life of sanctification? That's what Paul is saying. Why not live in a life of sin? A, it's not who you are in Christ. So you're going to be a conflicted, divided soul. B, it's because whatever you give your mind and your body to will control you. And C, because you don't want to forfeit the fruit of sanctification, the fruit of the Spirit. Is sin really worth it? Is it that much better? No. It brings things about which we are ashamed, not things about which we rejoice. Those are the three reasons. And so, I think there's many of us in this room that want to pursue sanctification. Amen? All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's pray together, and then let's continue to worship the Lord as we celebrate communion this morning. Father, help us to take seriously these principles. And and again, I take great joy, Father, in that it's science that's catching up with the Bible. It's science catching up with the Bible. Here, Paul knew, he knew so well the practical outworking of what we now understand about neuroplasticity. And so we thank you. We thank you that your word is true. We pray that you would give us insight, that you would help us through your Holy Spirit to give thought to what we are thinking about constantly and what we are doing constantly and to make the changes where we need to so that what controls us is your word and your spirit, that we become slaves of righteousness, that we become slaves of God, that we become people more and more characterized by love, joy, peace, and patience, a kindness, a gentleness, that when people encounter us, when they bump up against us, this is what they experience, because this is who you are making us in Christ Jesus. 
And I thank you for so many examples of that in our church family from which I draw inspiration and encouragement. And now we are going to come to the table and here we're going to celebrate once again and worship you, Lord Jesus, who has made all of this possible. Without you, none of this would be true. But in you, all of this is true. And we praise you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.